Chapter 2. The Pilgrimage to the House of Allah. I was 18 years of age when the Tunisian National Society of Scouts agreed to send me as one of the six Tunisian representatives to the first conference for Islamic and Arab Scouts, which took place in Mecca. I was the youngest member of the mission, and certainly the least educated, but there were with me two headmasters, a teacher from the capital, a journalist, and a fifth whose job I did not know, although I later realised that he was a relative of the then Minister for Education. The journey was rather indirect. Our first stop was Athens, where we stayed for two days. Next was Amman, the capital of Jordan, in which we spent four days, and then we arrived in Saudi Arabia and participated in the conference and performed the rites of pilgrimage and Umrah. I cannot describe my feelings when I entered the house of Allah for the first time. My heart was beating so fast, I felt as if it was coming out of my chest to see this ancient house for myself, and the tears kept coming out of my eyes endlessly. I imagine the angels carried me over the pilgrims and up to the roof of the Holy Kaaba, and answered the call of Allah from there. Allah, here I am, your servant, come to be at your service. Labakia alamu labakia, labaik. Listening to the other pilgrims, I gathered that most of them had waited for a long time and saved up throughout their lives to come to Mecca. In my case, the journey was sudden and I was not prepared for it. I remembered my father bidding me a tearful farewell when he saw the aeroplane ticket and knew for certain that I was going to perform the pilgrimage, saying, Congratulations, my son. Allah has willed. that you perform the pilgrimage before me at this age, for you are the son of Sidi Ahmed al-Tijani. Pray for me at Allah's house to forgive me and grant me the pilgrimage to his house. I fear that Allah himself called me and cared for me and brought to me the place where everybody longs to visit, although some cannot make it. I appreciated this opportunity. I knew I threw myself, I knew I appreciated this opportunity, therefore I threw myself into my prayers and tawaf, circling around the Kaaba. Even when the drinking from the water of Zamzam and going up the mountains where people competed to get to the Hera cave in Al Nur mountain, I was only beaten by a young Sudanese pilgrim, so I was second of the two. When I got there, I rolled myself on the floor as if I was rolling on the great prophet's lap and smelled his breathing. What great memories! They left such a deep impression on me that I will never forget. Allah has cared for me in many ways, for I was liked by everybody. I met in the conference, and many asked for my address in order to write to me in the future. As for my Tunisian companions, they looked down on me from the first meeting that we had at the Tunisian capital when we were preparing for the journey. I sensed their feelings, but I was patient, for I knew that the people of the north looked down on the people from the south and considered them backward. Soon enough, their views started to change. Throughout the journey and during the conference and the pilgrimage, I proved myself to be worthy of their respect due to my knowledge of poetry and my winning of many prizes. I went back to my country with more than 20 addresses from different nationalities. We stayed 25 days in Saudi Arabia, during which we met many learned Muslim scholars, ulama, and listened to their lectures. I was influenced by some of the beliefs of the Wahhabi sect and wished that all Muslims followed them. Indeed, I thought that they were chosen by Allah amongst all his worshippers to guard his house, for they were the purest and most knowledgeable people on earth, and Allah had given them soil so that they could serve and could care for the pilgrims, guests of the merciful.
When I came back from the pilgrimage to my country, I wore the Saudi national dress and was surprised by the reception that my father had prepared. Many people gathered at the station, led by sheikhs of the Isawiya, Tijani, Tijaniya, and the Khadriya, Sufi order, complete with ceremonial drums. They took me through the streets of our town, chanting and cheering. And every time we passed a mosque, I stopped for a short time, whilst people, especially the old folk, came to congratulate me, with tears in their eyes, longing to see the house of Allah and to visit the Prophet's grave. People looked at me as if I, they had not seen a young pilgrim, Hajj of my age, in the Gafsa before. I lived in the happiest day I lived the happiest days of my life during that period, and many people, including the noblest notables of the town, came to visit and to congratulate me and often asked me to read Al-Fatiha, the opening surah of the Qur'an. With the prayers in their presence of my father, whom I was embarrassed, although he kept encouraging me, every time a group of visitors left the house, my mother came to the sitting area to burn incense and read some amulets in order to get rid of me, my bad spells. My father kept the celebration going for three nights in the centre of the Tijani Sufi order. Each night he slaughtered a sheep for a banquet. People asked me of all sorts of questions. My answers were mainly to praise the Saudis for their efforts to support and spread Islam. Some people started calling me the Hajj Pilgrim. And whenever somebody shouted, shouted Hajj, it was only meant to me. Gradually, I became known amongst the various religious groups, especially the Muslims Brotherhood. And I went around the mosques lecturing on religious issues telling people not to kiss the graves or touch the woods for blessing because these are signs of polytheism. My activities started to increase and I was giving religious lessons on Fridays before the Imam's speech. I moved from Abi Yaqub Mosque to the Great Mosque. I moved from Abi Yaqub Mosque to the Great Mosque because the Friday prayers were held in different times. In those mosques, on midday in the former, and during the afternoons in the latter. On Sundays, my lessons were mostly attended by my students at the secondary school where I taught technology. They liked me and appreciated my efforts because I gave them a lot of my time, trying to help them in removing the clouds from their minds during the teachings of the atheists and communist teachers of philosophy. And there were plenty of them. My students used to wait with eagerness for these religious circles, and some of them came to my house for I bought a number of Islamic books and read them thoroughly to bring myself up to the standards of questions to be asked. I used to be asked. I used to be asked. During the year in which I did pilgrimage to Mecca, I completed the other half of my religious duties by getting married. It was the wish of my mother to see me married um, before she passed away. For she had seen the wedding, uh, weddings of all my half-brothers, and Allah gave her what she had wished, and I got married to a young lady that I had never met before. My mother died after having been present at the birth of my first and second child, and she was preceded by my father, who had died two years before her. Prior to his death, he did, a, he did the pilgrimage to Mecca, and two years later, before his death, he turned to Allah in repentance. The Libyan revolution succeeded during the period when the Arabs and the Muslims were feeling their humiliating defeat at the hands of the Israelis. When we saw that the young revolutionary leader speaking on behalf of Islam and praying among his people for the liberation of Al-Quds. I became attracted to his ideas as many young Muslims and Arabs and as a result we organized an educational visit to Libya by a group consisting of 40 men for the education department. We visited the country at the beginning of the revolution, and when we came back home, we were very optimistic and hopeful for a better future for Muslims and Arabs in the world. During the previous years, I had corresponded with some friends, and my friendship with a few of them had become very close, so that they even asked me to visit them. Thus, I made all the preparation for a journey during the summer vacation, which lasted three months. I planned to go to Libya and Egypt by the, by the road, and from there across to Lebanon, to, uh, from there across the sea to Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and then to Saudi Arabia. I meant to do um, Umrah there and to renew my commitment to the Wahhabiyah in those in whose fervor 
I campaigned amongst the students and in the mosques which we were frequented by the Muslim Brotherhood. My reputation passed from my hometown to other neighbouring towns, though through visitors who might attend the Friday prayer and listen to the lessons, then go back to their communities. My reputation reached Sheikh Ismail al Hadifi, the leader of the Sufi order in Tuza, capital of Al Najarid, and the birthplace of the famous poet Abu al Qasim al Shabi. This has many fo- this sheikh has many followers in Tunisia and abroad, especially among the working class in France and Germany. I received an invitation from him through his agents in Gafsa, who wrote me a long letter thanking me for my service services to Islam and the Muslims. In the letter, they claimed that the things I was doing would not bring me nearer to Allah. I had no, I had no learned sheikh. He was no sheikh. His sheikh will be the devil, and you need a sheikh to know you the way. Otherwise, half of the knowledge is not completed. They informed me that the greatest of his age, Sheikh Ishmael himself, had chosen me amongst all people to be one of his closest private circles of followers. I was absolutely delighted when I heard the news. In fact, I cried in response to the divine care which had elevated me to the highest and best places, simply because I had been following the steps of Sidi al Hadi al Afian, who was a Sufi Sheikh known for his miracles. I had become one of his closest followers. Also, I accompanied Sidi al Sidi Salab Bal Sayyid and Sidi al Jalani and other contemporary Sufi, le- Sufi leaders, so I eagerly waited for that meeting. When I entered the sheikh's house, I looked curiously at the faces, and the place was full of followers, among whom were sheikhs wearing spotless white robes, after the greeting ceremony ended. Sheikh Ishmael appeared, and everyone stood up and started kissing his hands with great respect. His deputy winked at me to tell me that this was the sheikh, but I did not know any enthusiasm, for I was waiting for someone, for something different from what I saw. I had drawn an imaginary picture of him in my mind in accordance with what his agents and followers had told me about his miracles, and all I saw was an ordinary man without any dignity or reverence. During the meeting, I was introduced to him by his deputy, and the sheikh received me warmly and sat me to his right and gave me some food. After dinner, the ritual ceremony started and the deputy introduced me again to take the oath from the sheikh, and everybody congratulated me and blessed me. Later on, I understood from what men were saying that I was known to them, which encountered, which encouraged me to disagree with some of the news, some of the answers given by the sheikh to questions from the audience. Such behaviour led some of the men to express their disgust and to consider it bad manners to, in the presence of the sheikh, who was usually left unchallenged. The sheikh sensed the uneasy atmosphere and tried to cool the situation by using his wits. So he said, "Who's he whose star is burning, his end will be shining. The audience took that as a graceful sign from the sheikh, which would guarantee my shiny end and congratulated me for that. However, the sheikh was clever and experienced, so he did not let me continue with my irritable incursion and told the following story. One day, a learned man attended a class held by a pious man, and the pious man asked the learned man to go and get washed, and so that learned man went and washed himself and returned to the class. The pious man repeated his demand, go and get washed. The learned man went and washed himself again, thinking that he had not done it right the first time. When he came back to the class, the pious man asked him to wash again. The learned man started crying and said, Master, I have washed myself from my work and I know a knowledge and I have nothing left except that which Allah has granted me through your hands. At that moment, the pious man said, now you can sit down. I realized that I was one, I was the one whom the sheikh referred to in the story, and everyone re- else realized that as well, for they, rebu- they rebuked me with, when the sheikh left us sheikh had left us to have a rest. I asked to be silent. I asked, they asked me to be silent and show some respect for the sheikh, lest I fail in my work, basing their argument on the Quranic verse, "O oh, you who believe, do not raise your voice above the voice of the prophet." And do not speak loud to him as you speak to another, to one another, lest your deeds become null whilst you do not proceed. I then recognised my limits, so I compiled and obeyed the orders, and the sheikh kept me near him, and subsequently I stayed with him for three days, during which I asked many questions, some of them to test his knowledge.
The Sheikh knew that they were, <coughs> the Sheikh knew that and used to answer me by saying that there are two meanings to the Quran, one revealed and one of the hidden to a seventh degree. He opened his private safe for me and showed me a personal document which contained the names of pious and learned people connecting him with Imam Ali via many people such as Abu al Hassan al Shahidi. It is worth noting that there are the that these are these meetings held by the Sheikh and those uh, spiritual ones are usually start with the Sheikh reciting and chanting some verses from the Quran. After that, he reads a poetic verse followed by chants and dikas, all by men. And these chants are mainly centered around asceticism, asceticism, piety in the re reunification for this life, and eagerness to seek the life hereafter. After having finished with this part, the first man on the right hand of the side of the Sheikh reads what he can from the Quran. And then he says, And Allah that truthfully and Allah said that truthfully. The Sheikh reads the beginning of another piece of poetry, and the whole congregation recites thereafter him. Each person then reading a Quranic verse. Shortly after that, the men start learning gently to the, uh, leaning gently to the left and to the right, moving with the rhymes of the chants. Until the Sheikh stands up, and with him all the congregation forming a circle with him at the center. Next, they start chanting, ah, 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 ah. And the Sheikh turns around in the center, then goes to each one of them. And shortly after, the tempo heats up, and the men start jumping up and down, shouting in an organized but irritating rhythm. After some hard work, quietness gradually prevails, and the Sheikh reads his last pieces of poetic verse. And then everybody comes to kiss the Sheikh's head and shoulders until they finally sit down. I have shared with those people in their rituals, but not convincingly, for they have contradicted my own beliefs and are not attributing any associates to Allah. Not to request anything from, but from Allah. I fell on the floor and my mind scattered between the two contradictory ideas. One being the Sufi ideology in which a man goes through a spiritual experience based on the feeling of fear, on asceticism, and on trying to approach Allah from the saints and learned men. The second idea was the Wahhabi, which had taught me that all of the second idea was the Wahhabi, which taught me that all of that was an attempt to attribute associates to Allah and that Allah will never forgive them. If the great Prophet Muhammad وسلم, cannot help nor could be interceded, then what is the value of those saints and pious people who came after him? In the spate of in the state, in spite of the new position given to me by the Sheikh, for he appointed me with his deputy in Gafsa. I was not totally convinced, although I sometimes sympathized with the Sufi orders and felt that I should continue to respect them for the sake of those saints and god fearing people. I often argued my I often argued basing my argument on the Quranic verses and call that call not with Allah, with Allah any other God, there is no God but He, Holy Quran. And if somebody said to me that Allah said, Oh you who believe, be careful, your duty to Allah and seeks means of nearness to him. I answered him quickly in the way that the Saudi ulama had taught me by saying, the way to seek Allah is by doing a good deed. In any case, my mind was rather confused and troubled during that period. But from time to time, some followers came to my house where we celebrated Al-Imra, a type of zikr. Our neighbours felt uneasy about the noise which we produced, uh, but could not confront me. Therefore, they complained to my wife via their views and when I learned about the problem, I asked the followers to celebrate Sika elsewhere. I excused myself by informing them that I was going abroad for three months. So I said farewell to my family and friends and sought my God, depending on him and not believing in any God but him. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa Muhammadin wa Very good. Very well read.